So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to um, Ben Webster, the Operational Head Teacher at LAE, to begin today's session. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Alex. Nice to meet you all. Um, so we're going to be talking you, to you today, particularly about managing transition from Key Stage 4 LAE in the time of COVID-19. I'll be talking to you about giving you a bit of context about LAE and also talking to you particularly about pastoral transitions. Um, I'll hand over to Claudia, who will quickly introduce herself. Hi everybody, I'm Claudia Harris and I'm the Deputy Head Academic and um, I have oversight of the curriculum, so the, you know, the, what, what A-levels we teach and how we teach them, um, and UCAS and progression as well. Uh, I'm Anushka Chakravarti, I'm Assistant Head Academic and I work very closely with Claudia um, in overseeing the academic side of the school, I have specific responsibility for um, our Oxford and Cambridge preparation, SCND lectures and a lot of the um, extracurricular and supercurricular support that goes around the main curriculum. Uh, hi everyone, I'm James. I'm in charge of teaching and learning here at LAE and I'll be talking to you about the kind of um, the things that we do with our teachers to continue to improve and develop the quality of teaching in the school. And we're also delighted to be joined by Ivan and Yishman, who are Year 12 students, and they'll be talking to you later on. So I'll kick off <clears throat> by just giving you a little bit of context uh, about the school, uh, about who we are. So we are LAE, London Academy of Excellence, Stratford. We were set up in 2012. We were the first free school sixth form at that time. There's been a number since and we are located in Stratford, Europe. We were set up with six uh, independent schools and they continue to provide us various um, different types of support um, and they are uh, Brighton College, uh, Caterham, um, Eton, uh, Forest, Highgate and UCS. And we were set up with the vision of promoting social mobility by providing a world-class A-level education to students in Newham and East London, aspiring to win places at top universities. In uh, 2020, um, so last year, over 200 students progressed to Russell Group universities, including 33 to Oxford and Cambridge. And since the first cohort of students sat their exams in 2014, more than a thousand students have gone on to study at Russell Group Universities. More than a hundred have gone on to study medicine, dentistry, veterinary medicine, and more than 150 have won offers at Oxford and Cambridge. We were last inspected by Ofsted in 2017, where we were graded outstanding. So that's just a little bit of context about the school. Now, now I'll pass over to Claudia. Um, no, I'll pass over to Ivan. Um, our year 12 student um, who's going to share his uh, reflections um, on year 12 um, and his transition experience. Yes, hello, my name is Ivan. I'm a year 12 student, so it's my first year of study. Um, during my transition to year 11, from year 11 to year 12, I did feel, um, well, <laughs> at first, my first impression was it's a really big school and obviously, um, I had high expectations for myself, but um, during the first week of induction, um, I did feel set. I did settle in really well. Um, got to know half, over half the year within the first week, which is good. Um, yeah, I yeah, there's not much to say, but um, it's a really, it's a really good school in terms of uh, from an academic perspective and also outside of a academic perspective in terms of co-curricular opportunities. Um, I do think that the school is good in, ter in terms of maintaining every student's mental and physical well-being, um, which which has helped me in um, during my study in LAE. Um, yeah. Um, That's uh, great. Uh, thank you, um, Ivan. And uh, Ayushman? Hi, my name is Ayushman. I think building on what Ivan said, I started year 11 and I ended year 11 not feeling academically challenged. And I came to LE with the expectation, or at least the hope that I would um, sort of find a very um, academic setting and um, 
community. And I think that's exactly what I experienced. Um, Ms. Webster described the school right now as giving, providing a world-class education. And I think that from my experience um, of year 12 so far, LEE, LEE has definitely delivered um, from sort of a academic co-curricular, we, we experienced quite an, sort of an intense um, curriculum at LEE doing four A-levels, we also do um, an EPQ. And I think that one thing that makes the academic experience at LEE sort of unique and incredibly different is that the teachers, um, both online and in person, live and breathe their subject. And I think that's something that I resonated with and I found quite special, which I hadn't experienced before. We don't just learn um, content sort of by um, by virtue of the specification, but we actually learn about how our academics and how our academic sort of competence can make change in and uh, make change in this world. And I think that's incredibly special. Um, and I think that synopsizes um, the academic experience really well at LEE, getting a world class education, but also seeing what does it mean to be an academic and what does it mean to love learning for its own sake? And I think that is um, truly special. Fantastic. Thank you very much to Ivan and Oshman there for a, a little uh, insight into the student experience in year 12. Um, so thank you very much, both of you. We'll march on. Um, if there's any questions specifically for the students, if anybody wants to put them in the chat box and we will pass those on to them. Um, but thank you very much, both of you. OK, so um, as that I head up the academic team here and Anushka and I work um, really closely to make sure that year 12 have a smooth transition from GCSE into their very intense A-level programme that you were just hearing about from, from Irishman. Um, so in a normal year, it's quite a jump. And um, those of you who are members of Pixel 6 might recognise this, might recognize this from um, a recent Pixel um, podcast where they were talking about this, this work of Bill Bridges, talking about transition in a wider sense of that when you, you move from one setting to another, there are a number of losses that come with that alongside all these exciting opportunities. So in a normal year, we're used to having 240 students who are new to LAE, we're a sixth form only provider, and they've lost their sort of identity of the school they've come from, their physical environment, um, their structure of their, their normal timetable, um, their attachments to their friends um, and, and all that identity that comes around being part of a school. And we work very quickly during the transition to make them feel part of it. So I think Ivan just said, you know, he'd met half the year group within the first week here. So we have this very intensive sort of induction. Um, we knew that the year group coming in in sep last September were going to have challenges not having been at school since March, not having sat their GCSEs. We did our absolute best to make that transition as smooth as possible within the context of COVID. You know, they were then out again in January, as you know. Um, we made some mistakes. Um, it wasn't completely smooth, also as, quite as smooth as the, the boys made it sound there. Um, and through learning from um, what happened in not what happened makes it sound like it was a disaster area. It wasn't at all, but um, there were some things that we think we could have done better. And so we planned for this September, understanding the, the losses and changes that year 12 have been through. Um, and again, not sitting full GCSE exams. Um, and we think we can, can make it even better this September. So we've thought about our responses. We're putting into place what we're calling a recovery curriculum, and that's got an academic aspect and a co-curricular and pastoral aspect. Um, and, you know, again, sort of quoting Bill Bridges, we're thinking about what do we restore and what do we recover as they come back in September from pre-COVID? What actually are we going to just replace that we think is it can be done better now with everything we've learned from COVID um, and redesigning things in the light of that? And what might we actually relinquish or, or give up either from the time of COVID or before? So Anushka and I'll talk you through those academic um, transitions that we're planning for in September. Um, we've started the transition now, as I'm sure all of you with six forms are doing. So we have um, had two year 11 welcome days. 
Um, we have done those remotely again this year. So we did it on Teams. We did taster lessons on Teams. Um, so it's difficult because they don't get to meet each other. They don't get to be in the building, but at least they have had a taste of A-level teaching um, and got to know teachers a little bit through that. And we've sent them off from those welcome days with pre-reading for their A-levels. As soon as they get here um, in September, we do baseline testing with them and we use Alice um, for maths and verbal and non-verbal reasoning. We do some maths and science aptitude tests with them as well. And we do lucid testing because quite a lot come to us with undiagnosed SEN. And then there's a very intense induction session where they're with their tutors um, being inducted into the culture and values of LAE, which um, Ben will talk to you more about. And there's some academic induction around the jump to A level. How do you cope with that jump to A level in a resilient way? Uh, we also start our uh, year 12 students right at the beginning of the academic year on something called the MPQ programme, which is our mini EPQ programme. Every single year 12 students takes part in that and it's a, a real um, in introduction for our students into the academic uh, outlook and approach that we have at LAE. So students will be introduced to academic research, academic styles of writing, academic literacy, oracy, and through the MPQ programme, um, it helps them make that transition from perhaps more simplistic style of literacy and writing at um, key stage four right into it immediately in key stage five. Um, similarly, our academic enrichment program supports that. We have um, academic literacy oracy taught explicitly for all year 12s. Uh, we also run a lecture program uh, weekly uh, after school. Uh, and again, getting students immediately used to being in a very academic formal environment, asking challenging questions of experts in their field and we've had everyone from David Lammy to AC Grayling. We've had high profile speakers from across subjects um, sharing their wisdom with our students. Uh, we have the Pathways programme which is our weekly careers programme and again students start that from the moment they arrive at LE and that allows them to transition from key stage four with just the focus on GCSEs and the classroom to thinking more about their future after school employability, developing the skills that they need to transition from school to university or into the world of work. And finally, academic mentoring. Again, at least weekly, um, students meet one to one with their tutor to talk about their academic progress, um, think about how they are developing in preparation for the next phase for progression and employment. So, you know, this, it works very well. Usually, you know, year, year 11 students, they've done their GCSEs and then we really help them rapidly transition into our very intense four A-level programme plus uh, EPQ. Um, and they have their form tutor that supports them with that outside the classroom and they have the you know, expert A-level teachers that help them inside the classroom. To add to that in our recovery curriculum, you know, this idea of re redesign, recover, um, restore and relinquish, we have um, redesigned some of our um, events. So, for example, all our admissions events will still be more or less remote. Parents and carers evenings will stay remote. Um, so I suppose we're relinquishing face to face parents and carers evenings. We think they're much, much better and more effective locally. Um, we are uh, um, we've got some tutoring systems you want to talk about stem link i think that's a really good innovation so, yes it's an, it's an innovation i suppose it's a it's a form of redesign for our intervention program we've been able to tap into the resources provided by our partner our independent partner schools that ben mentioned at the start uh, and UCS school very kindly offered um, tutoring in small groups to students who perhaps found that transition from key stage four to key stage five uh, difficult in the STEM subjects and ran weekly online sessions for them. We're hopeful that that collaboration can continue uh, next year um, on, through the online platform um, and it has made uh, that kind of partnership much more accessible for us on the academic side of the school. 
Yeah. And then similarly, um, we have introduced last year, we're keeping them again this year, graduate teaching assistants. You know, we said we knew um, that year the year 11s weren't going to be as prepared as usual. Um, and I think actually it's such a shame because the last few years where the new GCSEs have kicked in, students have come making that transition much easier to A level um, and the, the, I think they're finding it harder again. So we knew we'd have to put some support in. So we've put graduate teaching assistants in um, and we are going to put into place a summer school. Um, we don't get any funding for that for 16 to 19. But all our students have got maths and English GCSE when they come to us. Uh, but we're we're running three days of maths, modern languages and biology, um, you know, preterm intensive courses just to get them a bit more confident in, in those subjects where there's quite a big jump. Um, the other thing that we are recovering is vertical tutor groups because we had year 12 and year 13 bubbles. We're going back to vertical tutoring and I think that really helps with the academic transition. You've got year 13s that understand what it's like making that jump and that can help them and talk them through. Another thing that we've taken from COVID is, is sort of more uh, tracking earlier on in the process, which has allowed us to make identify students who need more support earlier in their time at LAE uh, and that's meant that we've made earlier curriculum changes than we have in previous years. We've used the graduate teaching assistants to support with interventions and again I think that's something that we have benefited from and we'd like to take forward in future years. So that's a quick whiz through the academic transition. I'll hand you back to Ben to talk about pastoral transitions. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Anushka. So pastoral tran transition. So I've just got some points here. I'll talk through what we do in terms of transition and also share my reflections as, as well on things that we've learned um, over this uh, kind of pandemic period as well. So I, uh, my reflection, I think, over the past few years is how important it is to induct the students before they um, even come through the door for the first time. So all that we do in terms of our, um, our admissions and our marketing really sets the tone in terms of the ethos of the school, um, what they expect in the um, what they um, should expect when they come into the school. Um, we, for example, run a very extensive co-curricular program. So every student would do sports, every student take part in a club, every student um, in year 12 would do kind of a volunteering program. It's so important that they know all of this um, and they know everything that um, that it involves to be a student at LE before they even come um, to the school. Um, so a lot of emphasis is then placed on that information um, before they come to uh, the induction of that transition. So there is a mismatch um, of expectations. Um, and like Claudia said, we, we have incredibly um, kind of packed and, and busy experience. Um, and it's important students uh, are aware of that um, uh, in, in advance. So then when they do come, um, the induction experience uh, that we have, um, which we've refined um, over the years, um, now in around two and a half days um, in which um, they attend a, a variety of different assemblies and workshops uh, run by uh, a number of different people within the school. We are um, one of our reflections from this year, well, what, one of the things that we necessarily had to do last year was ensure that they were in uh, a small bubble, didn't in interact with a lot of people. We are planning for a lot more interaction between um, students and uh, staff members and within themselves as well, um, so that there is a, kind of a, 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 a better um, whole year group culture that we're able to build through that experience. We have a house system at the school. Uh, the house system is tied to the uh, independent partner schools that we have. So there are six houses uh, named after and associated with the partner schools. That is important for the transition. We have heads of house who are middle leaders who play a role in the, the culture within the house um, and also the monitoring, uh, pastoral monitoring of all the students within their houses. The transition meetings we've run now for a few years with our school counsellors. So we have the equivalent of a full-time counsellor at 
the school and they meet a cross section of students just for a one off meeting um, in the first few weeks of school. So they would meet um, 20, 25 students um, that we've identified probably for two reasons. One, as a cross section to represent the student experience in year 12, uh, but also if there have been any uh, flags um, or concerns within the first uh, week or so, um, or if we've received any kind of safeguarding or child protection files that we feel that we need to um, kind of intervene and, and see whether we need to support the student. Those transition meetings are a really good uh, litmus test at that time of how students are transitioning into the school um, and can then quickly identify um, if there is anything that we need to respond to on either an individual or whole year group level. I kind of jump a point here. Um, the other way that we do that is with the induction survey. So that we do this four weeks after they join, um, we've got a very um, long comprehensive survey about all aspects of their experience within the school um, that we've now run for like six or seven years. So we're able to see kind of trends um, over time, uh, but also um, immediately again respond to any um, issues with transition that may appear um, and that is also they identify the houses they're in as well so the houses heads of house also own kind of the aspect of the the student transition there going back to the role of student leadership this is something that we really have spent a lot of time putting resources and promoting um, at LAE and we have a number of different student leadership uh, vehicles um, that uh, are ways that students can get involved in the running and um, promotion of the values of the school. So we have our equalities network, so we've got an LGBTQ plus network, we've got a mental health network, we've got our BAME network and our gender equality network. Uh, we've also got uh, an eco network, uh, amnesty group, school council as well. And what happens in the first two weeks is that these networks run a network fair, it feels a little bit like a freshers fair. Um, they have their stalls. All the year 12s are invited to come along um, and learn a little bit about these student networks. And the networks play a role in supporting uh, students um, in various groups feel like they uh, have a place that they belong um, and can give a, a point of contact as well. And the networks um, have um, uh, kind of regular um, social events as well, where the new year 12s are able to come along um, and join. So that's a, a really important part actually of quickly getting um, students into the, the ethos of the school. Um, and I should have mentioned this before, but, but being a, a sixth form college, we, we don't have uh, one feeder school. We've got students from I think over 100 different schools uh, who come to LAE and there's a huge advantage and opportunity there is that there aren't these kind of big groups, uh, friendship groups who come um, and that means that everybody's in the same boat. It's a little bit, you know, like um, going uh, to, to university in that, that first few weeks um, and just providing a load of opportunities there for people to have loads of um, a lot of different chances to form new friendships um, and to um, settle into the school. And then the co-curricular programme is really important with that. So like I mentioned before, they will all do a club um, and society on a Wednesday um, and we got a whole kind of programme and they're run both by uh, staff um, and also student led clubs and organisations as well. And that's another chance for them to interact with people outside of their, their tutor group or academic setting. We've got a sports and wellbeing programme on a Thursday. We've got our careers programme that they all take part in on a Friday. They all do the mini PQ and Anusha and Anushka spoke about um, on uh, the Tuesday um, and we all have their pastoral, um, tutorial and academic mentoring on a Monday. So every afternoon there's more opportunities for them to um, be interacting with other people uh, in the school. Um, of course, the safeguarding team uh, play a really important role in the monitoring of the transitions and um, anybody um, else I'm speaking to who's uh, in, in a 16 to 19 environment would probably understand as well the, the, the importance of, kind of really proactively getting in touch with the secondary schools um, to make sure that we do have uh, those safeguarding records um, as quickly as possible um, because we're often you know, quite blind in terms of the needs of the students when they arrive 
rise um, and we only really you know on enrollment day know who will be the students who are here so we put a lot of time to quickly kind of um, getting in touch with and say over those hundred different schools to get those safeguarding records um, and then our safeguarding team the structure of that is that we run um, a case management system so each safeguarding member uh, would be assigned a particular case um, and they'll be in charge of um, coordinating the support for um, that uh, that young person um, so it, we, we work hard to make sure that we, we quickly know um, who are those people who, who need that support in year 12 and then the last point here is our behavior dashboard so uh, we run a behavior point system so you would get a verbal warning and then we have different discipline levels of disciplinary based on the level of severity of the behavior and then we've got a behavior um, dashboard that um, pulls together the, the points um, that um, is updated every week and the head of house again plays a role in identifying any accumulation of, of points so if we've got um, a year 12 who've you know getting loads of verbal warnings to homework that is immediately spotted because you can see that trend um, and they're able to um, intervene to explore uh, the reasons uh, behind that you know what further support you know what do we need to bring in here do we need to involve the SEND team you know is there a, a safeguarding uh, concern does they need more uh, enhanced academic metering with the tutor etc uh, but um, the um, the kind of culture of um, um, quickly kind of logging those little things uh, allows us to also identify where there are issues and quickly put in support as well so very quick talk through uh, the pastoral system um, any questions throw them into the chat box i'll hand over to james thanks ben hi everyone um next slide please we had to get that joke in didn't we Brilliant, thank you. So yeah, I'll talk very quickly about teaching and learning. Um, I mean, for me, I'm biased because I'm the person in charge of it, but I really do think it's the silver bullet. Um, you know, brilliant teaching and learning is what's going to get our young people on into the next stage of their of their life. Um, and for our students, it's it's places at top universities. So this quote kind of sums up to me the importance of quality uh, teaching. But you know that already because I think you're all teachers. Next slide. Um, and here, what I want to talk about is our culture that we've built here um, at LAE with regards to teaching and learning. When I'm thinking specifically about the transition, I think teachers have got a difficult job to do, particularly in this uh, early part of year 12, which is to gather these students from, as Ben says, almost 100 different secondary schools and get them into a place where they're in good routines. Um, where teachers are able to very quickly assess and identify gaps in understanding and knowledge and then adapt their teaching and put in place really good support within the lesson um, to get students up to a standard that they want them to be. But then to balance that with the need to be building them pretty quickly towards year 13 and then on into undergraduate study. And so we've got on the one hand this wish, I think Ayushman mentioned it, to build very scholarly academic lessons that almost feel like university seminars or workshops. But then on the other hand, taking hundreds of year 11s who actually really need a GCSE plus uh, kind of style of lesson. And so I think we're transitioning within LAE. Um, probably if you were to come and look at lessons in the autumn term in year 11, you would see lessons that are quite familiar um, to lessons you would see in a secondary school with, with year 11 students, but then maybe later in year 12 and certainly then into year 13, they would feel a little different. And so our teachers are kind of trying to make that transition with our students. How do we, um, I'll tell you some kind of key things that teachers do in lessons uh, for your information in a minute, but I thought I'd share this. This underpins the culture of teaching and learning we have in the school. So number one, we have a culture of autonomy where teachers are trusted and particularly middle leaders. So lead teachers are trusted to make decisions in the best interests of their students. So how they go about delivering their lessons, um, how they go about organising their curriculum is very much a decision for them in consultation with senior leaders. We also have a culture of innovation and we really try to promote um, a culture similar with the students where people can try something and then admit actually I'm sorry it didn't work that was a total failure this is what we've learned from it we're going to try something else but equally to try things and then don't keep them to themselves share them with their colleagues so that we can all benefit so we have a hopefully an innovative and open culture of sharing good practice 
And then finally, part of our culture here is building um, um, well, maintaining and enhancing a culture of rigor. So really high expectations. Teachers have very high expectations of themselves, of their colleagues um, and also their students. Uh, and there shouldn't be any kind of um, excuse making, you know, all oh, this student, this student, this student. Actually, it should be every student is aiming for really ideally a star or a um, and that's where we're heading. So that's the culture. If we have yes, so I definitely won't read these uh, to you line by line, but we have 10 what we call LAE lesson essentials. And these are not, um, this is not used as a checklist. It's not that teachers should be doing all 10 things every minute of every lesson. Uh, it's where opportunities present themselves, teachers should take that opportunity to do these things. So we would hope almost every lesson presents itself with an opportunity to express a clear purpose in a sequence. We really want to see students being able to make links within and between their subjects. We want them to have lots of time to think hard and really be stretched. That's the academic rigour that we're looking for. Um, we also want teachers to be able to adapt their, um, their teaching to meet the needs of, of learners. And a particular problem we have or can have in some lessons is kind of a slower pace. And so we're really wanting to see lots of energetic pace, but not leaving anybody behind. Really good oracy and academic language, which um, Anushka talked about our academic literacy programme, building on that and making sure students are demonstrating that. Um, academic literacy isn't something they just do on the side. It's then meant to be applied in their learning. And then next slide. There are another five which are here, which is yeah, really good checking of understanding. Um, taking opportunities where it presents themselves to use technology and then partly uh, at the end, really important underpinning every lesson, a culture of our core values, um, building them for the next stage of their education and making sure that they're prepared for life in modern Britain as well. So those essentials, teachers are well used to the language of those essentials. We use it, um, we use that language in our learning walks and our observations. So teachers get WWWs, EBIs based around these essentials and they also the essentials underpin our CPD offer. So it might be that we have a programme focused on one of these or a part of one of these essentials. Let's say, I don't know, checking of understanding. Um, we just had a pathway of CPD for our teachers just on that uh, element of teaching and learning. So th those kind of underpin everything that we do in teaching and learning here in the school. If I just talk to you, I think I'm, yeah, got this slide here. So how do we do this? I said to you that we try to promote a culture of innovation, of trialing ideas, evaluating them and then sharing them. How do we do this? So we have a team of people, outstanding teachers in the school called the professional learning team, and they take a lead uh, in, with me um, in gathering and sharing really good practice. And that can come from educational research and attending um, CPD events, visiting our partner schools and other schools in the area, um, but it can also come mostly, I would say, from the brilliant practice that we have going on within the school. Um, and so we're always trying to shuffle around, you know, chemistry might be fantastic at questioning, so therefore can chemistry share that with other departments in the school? We have built into our timetable fortnightly PD, so professional development for all teachers takes place every when every other Wednesday afternoon, and we try to um, keep teachers together for a term on a given theme, and that way we find that teachers get the time they need to distill down their their thinking, to discuss their ideas with their colleagues, to go away and try something, to then evaluate it, to come back, to say, okay, that didn't quite work, let me try this way. And so by giving them um, a term's worth of sessions, six sessions, then we don't get, as we have in the past, feedback from teachers saying, oh, it was all too rushed and I didn't have time to really embed that. So I would really recommend that if that's not a system you have already. We also have these weekly five minute takeaways. So um, as part of our Monday morning briefing, it's on a rotor throughout the year. By the end of the year, every teacher in the school will have spoken to the whole teaching staff about an idea or a strategy or a resource that they've used um, and found useful. And then we also, before I talk about WOW Weeks, we also have this teacher toolkit, 
which is uh, here, it's kind of like a brochure. And this is the kind of paper version, paper repository of all of that great practice that goes on here in the school. Um, it also includes the educational research that I was talking about and kind of really great tips and strategies that we've um, pinched from other schools. Um, we update that, we try to update it every year, so I'm just redrafting it for next year. Um, and again, this is the, my biggest fear is that this just sits in dusty shelves somewhere and actually we try to make sure it's used in CPD sessions and people are actually referring to it and going around holding them. At least for my benefit, they go around holding them anyway. Um, and so then finally, WOW Weeks. Claudia, if you wouldn't mind just putting the next slide on. So this is a Watching Others Work Week. And we do them over a fortnight now because again we got feedback from teachers saying actually they didn't have enough time within one week to, to do this justice so we do it over a fortnight um everyone in the school it's voluntary signs up to say um you know come and see me period five on thursday i'm doing something really great on um pace teachers who are free at that time can then sign up we do this electronically now but it used to be on a whiteboard um teachers who are free at that time and are interested in seeing ideas about PACE would go along, watch the lesson, and then they send the teacher a positive kind of postcard. So the postcard is very simple. It's a sentence. One thing I took from your lesson, I'm going to try mine is dot dot dot, and they send that to the teacher. And I have oversight of that. So by the end of the fortnight, I have, you know, almost 100 bits of feedback that have gone throughout the school and hopefully teachers, because it's voluntary, um, and it's not kind of micromanaged. We lure teachers in with really good prizes like days off, chocolates, wine, um, and that makes it very popular, very low stakes and actually very fun. And it's a great way to make sure that people are kind of still engaged with seeing others teach, learning new ways of doing things and not just kind of staying static. Um, so that was another idea I thought I would share with you. I've gone dramatically off tight off transition theme but i think hopefully great teaching and learning will aid the transition is the is the gist of my um bit is there one more slide claudia yeah so uh, really this book which i read a couple of years ago kind of sums up my thinking which is us as school leaders giving teachers really specific targeted feedback so in our case linked to our essentials in a climate of trust Teachers here have real autonomy and we're not worried if they try things and they don't work alongside that time to reflect. And I said we've given a term for PD, we give a fortnight for the wow weeks, always trying to build in as much time as we can. Those senior leaders are going to best promote confidence amongst their staff. And I hope if you ever do come to visit LAE, you'll find generally very happy and confident teachers who are doing a brilliant job. Thank you. OK, so we, we've got time for questions. So we've got a question in the chat. Uh, do you, and if yes, how, include the home front of the students during the transition? Do, uh, Dirk, are you able to un unmute um, and talk, talk with us? What, what, what do you mean by the home front? Uh, the home front, yes, I am uh, able to unmute. Um, what I mean with the home front is the um, uh, the parents uh, or whatever home situation uh, a particular child is in. So in the, the second week of um, of year 12, we run a, a meet the tutor evening, evening, a parent and carer evening, um, where parents and carers um, come um, and they have a chance to meet uh, the tutor directly. Uh, and the tutor serves as the main kind of conduit of the communication between home and the school. Yeah, we also have um, settling in reports um, just after half term in the autumn term um, where tutors give a sort of one to four score with one being the, the best and four being the, the lowest of how the students settled in at school. So their organisation, homework, punctuality, um, core values. So it's a mix of culture and values and academic organization um, and that goes home um, 
everything now and this is a kind of a, a covid keep really that we've stopped sending any paper out that's all through us system we have a system like sims called isams um, which has a parent portal and parents can and carers can log into that and they can see how students are getting on having said that we're quite careful about what we do release we don't release early assessment results or any of these baseline testing type things because um we have a real mix of, of parents but many of them are extremely ambitious for their, their uh, kids the, they've done very well at GCSE and before sometimes the jump to A level is as you know really tough and some subjects chemistry and maths in particular there's a slower transition so we don't release those results to parents because the, the you know minute they see their kids even getting a C grade let alone DZs or U's in those early tests would get a barrage of phone calls so we're quite careful about um, the communication with home thank you and I, and I got another question. Uh, um, uh, if if no one else wants the floor, obviously, it goes right. Yeah. Um, do you uh, during the transition support the pupils or young adults on how to revise? So, uh, as Claudia mentioned, we do have. Um, early testing, uh, low stakes testing um, as part of our half termly assessment calendar. And as part of that, we really encourage our teachers, lead teachers, teachers um, to prepare the students carefully for those assessments and to teach them explicitly how to uh, revise for those assessments. So those uh, early assessments are normally very targeted. Students sometimes will have seen a question before and planned it together with the teacher and that way they are modelling the revision techniques that we would expect them to carry on doing independently in future assessments. Yeah and then before the first major set of exams, so the first formal, they have half term assessments and the, the revision for those will be, as Anusha said, very structured with teachers. Before their mocks in January, um, they'll have a tutorial with their tutor specifically about how to revise in different revision techniques. Um, and, you know, obviously different things work differently, but sometimes students have got stuck in one way of thinking that what they're doing is effective revision and it's not and so it's a way for tutors to talk to to students about like give them some tips of different ways of doing things Claudia you want to also kind of build on to that with the helps and the helps perhaps uh, yeah, I forgot about helps and helps. This is a, a pixel. I keep plugging pixel. I don't work for them. Um, but this was something we brought in from from pixel that we use a horse fourth quadrant, which is um, where you map their predicted A levels. So there's this progress against their effort grades. So we do both effort and life progress grades every half term and an estimated grade and you you get quadrants you get some students that are trying incredibly hard are working very hard and they're still making low effort so we call them LELPs low effort high effort oh, sorry, low high progress helps yes helps high, helps. Effort, low high effort low progress and then the ones that aren't trying very hard are low effort low progress um, there are some very annoying students that we're all familiar with who are the low effort, high progress students. Yeah. We we leave them to get on with it, and but before they go to university, they need help with how to work properly. But the helps and the LELPs may, are our main sort of focus groups, whole school focus groups, um, and we have assemblies with them, assemblies, the, like group meetings with them where we teach them how to revise. Um, and our learning coach works with them individually as well. But we wait a little bit, don't we, to get to that point. So that's not something that I would say is part of our early transition. It's more about the transition from key stage four exams to key stage five exams. So it's it happens closer to their first set of formal assessments in an exam hall. Uh, so it'll happen probably from around February yeah. of their year 12 onwards we'd identify those students try to give them an opportunity to test different revision techniques so that they're in a good position by the time they do their end of year 12 assessments in may mm. thank you
Um, Alex has a question in the chat um, around making the point that we're going to have cohorts of exams who will be uh, sitting A levels potentially having not sat uh, GCSEs, um, so sitting um, national um, externally externally validated exams um, for the first time. Um, how are we preparing these students um, academically and managing their their well being uh, throughout year thirteen? Well, we could start off with the academic and then, then pass it back to you, Ben, for the well-being, perhaps. But yeah, we, we've recognised that, that the year 12, current year 12 cohort had their mocks, they had the GCSE cancelled, then had their mocks cancelled in January. We sat mini mocks with them in March to tr get them into the habits of JCQ style exams. All our in-house exams are sat in JCQ conditions. Um, and we've then they've just sat their end of year 12 exams like mini a levels but again they were slightly shortened so that we could fit in all the year 13 assessments and i'm sure nearly every sixth form in the country has had to go through the same um, negotiations so year 12 are going into year 13 having done slightly less preparation for for big high stakes exams than they normally would but we've been lucky enough to be able to do two sets with them they're going to have some transitional tests again in exam conditions when they come back in September. They'll then have mocks in January and some further full paper mocks in April. So we yeah, we've recognised that that they need a transition from 12 to 13 that's going to involve quite a lot of formal examining. And that, of course, links into um, anxiety about those exams and, and not being used to it. And so, Ben, over to you. I think it's exactly that connection, which is that the, the practice and the JCQ um, uh, conditions for, for exams directly then supports their kind of well-being um, because they're not going to be um, sitting um, ex kind of these exams in um, these existence for, for for the first time. So I think that there's it's such an important connection between the academic calendar um, and their well-being as well. And it, additionally, with subjects, you know, finishing off their curriculum before Easter um, in terms of the teaching available, so that then provides, you know, a good running um, in terms of the preparation and revision um, in, in, in order to get them um, prepared and ready for, for their exams. And then, of course, in addition to that, it's all the usual um, well-being interventions um, that, that we will be running, the support of the counsellor, the tutors, um, the heads of house as well. Um, we've run um, a, a, an excellent um, programme over the last few years in coordination with Queen Mary University London, um, and that happens in the spring term, which is kind of great kind of um, preparation for their um, exams and that's a well-being course that year two and year three psychology students from Queen Mary University London um, meet with um, small groups of our students um, to explore different well-being strategies um, and every week they look at different strategy they have a small group discussion about their well-being and then the week after they reflect on the implementation of that strategy and a lot of those are also um, about strategies about dealing with um, academic and exam related uh, stress and anxiety. We just remembered one other thing. <laughs> so uh, what assists with the um, assessment calendar, which is helping to prepare students for these first national exams, is that we do have an, uh, an examiner in every single department. And that means that these assessments are being marked by those who would be marking the national exam. So they have a really good sense of where students are um, and are able to give really expert advice in terms of preparing the students ex in terms of exam technique for success in those um, in those A-levels. Do we have any other questions? I know you've touched on this um, throughout, Ben. I'm just going to come in and ask another one as well. So there's lots of things that you've changed um, during this pandemic period. And I know there's some that you said you'll definitely be keeping. Do you think that um, any of those things, I guess you would have tried out without the, the push of the pandemic? And what would you say are the, the top things that you'll be keeping and would encourage others to try if they have not already? 
I'll, I'll start off with one um, and then I'm, I know Claudia Mishka have several and probably James does as well. So mine is what we're not keeping because of the pandemic, which is detention. So we used to do um, <laughs> weekly weekly detentions um, and I was always a bit nervous about, you know, if we take that away, is that going to have a knock on effects on behaviour? Um, we are, weren't able to do uh, detentions um, during the pandemic for the entirety of this year. That's meant that we'd had to strengthen the disciplinary hearing system um, and it hasn't had the type of knock on effect that you'd expect. So we're not going to be keeping uh, detentions and let's help me take the leap. Um, so that's one example. Um, Claudia? Um, yeah, so we're not, we're keeping, we're relinquishing, I think I mentioned parents and carers, in-person parents and carers meetings. Also we used to do for admissions in-person interviews. Um, we're not doing that, we're doing um, online remote guidance meetings that work very well this year um, <clears throat> we are we thought carefully about whether to we had all of our afternoon activities remote and it did mean that it was a very quiet calm um, nice experience for people in the building on in the afternoons and we thought very carefully about whether to keep a lot of our things like the careers pathways lectures um, and clubs and things like that on remote and get people out of the building but actually part of the excitement of the college is the the buzz that comes with all that co-curricular activity on site um, they also do you know their sports and um, every Thursday afternoon so we we thought carefully about that but we are bringing that back on site and in person I think um with our lectures, certainly having the infrastructure now to have online lectures does at least give us that option moving forward. But I think the preference is obviously to have the lecture on site. Um, another thing that we adapted this year with with COVID um, was putting on uh, EPQ presentations online. Uh, and really streamlining that process. And I think, again, I don't know if we would have done that had it not been for COVID. I think we had thought about ways of streamlining and it hadn't occurred to us that the online platform might be a way of doing that. Again, now we have the infrastructure. I think there are definitely aspects of that that we would, we would continue with in the future. Um, I think with me, it's the, the, the pandemic um, has forced us all to engage with technology and use technology for the purpose of teaching and learning. And it's massively strengthened our teachers' confidence with using technology appropriately. So I think it's fair to say maybe before the pandemic, where ICT was used in lessons, it probably it wasn't used that often. And where it was used, it was perhaps maybe an add-on um or a kind of you know could do without it hasn't really added much whereas now teachers of all kinds are picking up and using um things that they've they've learned through their online teaching and then bringing them into the classroom so we're having much more kind of rapid instant online assessment using mobile phones that's something that people want to keep but actually they would have probably never done it if if we hadn't have gone through this this awful process. So yeah, using technology more appropriately and more confidently is definitely the thing I would say. Brilliant, thank you all so much for that. Um, that was really interesting. Um, just keeping an eye on the time as well. I think if it's all right with you, um, we will hold there for questions, but if anyone does have any more that ping up after the event, please do feel free to send them over to us at events at newschoolsnetwork.org um, and we'll get them over to the team at LAE for you and I'm sure they'll be very happy um, to respond to those for you as well. Um, yeah, big thank you for joining us. So brilliant presentation, Ben, Claudia, Anushka, James, Ivan and Ayushman. Thank you so much, very useful. Um, you should just be noticing a quick poll um, which has been added into the chat and gone live on your screens now. Um, so if you've got a moment to stick around and just respond to that, we would really appreciate your feedback. Um, we will aim um, to get the slides out to you um, in a bit of a paired back form following this presentation. And likewise, we will send a link around to attendees um, with this video as well, if there's anything that you do want um, to watch back again. 
Um, if not, once that poll is done, I want to say one massive thank you once again to all of our presenters. I hope you have a lovely evening and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks for organising it, New Schools Network. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Good evening. Bye. Bye.